Okay. So we had a bunch of really wonderful speakers. I have a lot of text on my slide, but hopefully we can keep moving. Um, as I was just introduced, my name is Miki Tomita, and I'm a teacher um, at a K-12 public charter school across the street, University Laboratory School. I'm currently teaching seventh grade science, and um, I head up a high school elective class and program called Project Pono, which my wonderful students are here today. Um, so it's a little scary, the title, Eco-Zombies, Sustainability Stress, um, and Fallout, which are really just secondary effects of the sustainability movement in my head. Um, but what I'd like to start with is actually talking about my primary engagement with the sustainability movement, which is Project Pono. So to start, before that though, is to go down to the base of what is Pono, so we can talk about Project Pono. So what is Pono? It's actually a lot of things. This is just one fourth of one of six definitions that's provided in Pukui and Ebert, which is looked at as the authoritative Hawaiian dictionary. Um, as you can see, pono has to do with morality, with righteousness, with balance. It's a verb, it's a noun, it's an adjective, it's, it's, it's a way of living, according to Malcolm Naya Chan. And because I'm from Maui and that's my roots, pono is everywhere. If you drive on Maui, you see all these stickers everywhere, signs, t-shirts, pono. Um, it, on Maui, it's considered doing what's right. It has been adopted and adapted as part of um, youth campaigns and, and youth sportsmanship. So going to Project Pono then. Project Pono is an elective class that I started a couple years ago because I saw a need in my school, um, a need to help students cultivate values that um, we don't necessarily te teach in Western education. And so what I did was I started a program, Project Pono, and the primary focus is on Malama Aina which is um, a, a version of environmental stewardship that you've heard about in previous talks um, that's based or grounded in um, an indigenous Hawaiian perspective or worldview. It's also though, because I'm a teacher, it was about service learning. So rather than just community work days and about doing community service and doing a one-shot deal, the students were charged with learning about their topics and teaching others. So to do that, we created the elective class, which meets 45 minutes a day every day except on Fridays when we meet for, we meet for only 40. And um, during that class time, what students do is they make phone calls, they make planning meetings, they um, get in touch with legislators, they apply for grants, um, they really design projects or partner up with existing agencies to join into projects that they can open up to the rest of the community. So they head up these programs that benefit and that engage multiple communities of people made up from different backgrounds and multiple ages. The one thing that I push the most in all of their activities is that they have to always deepen their engagement. If they start thinking about food, and everybody's into this growing your own food, or grow food, grow good food, that's fine. Start off with growing food, and then think about, when I grow this food, what does it mean to the world? When I grow this food, what does it mean to the person next to me who doesn't have access to this food? So it's an ever deepening understanding of, say the topic is food, you go from food to food, so, um, food security, which is everybody has food, and then onto food democ democracy, is, is this food being grown in the right way? And then onto food justice and food sovereignty. So thinking about what other resources are we impacting as we grow this food. So what do the kids do? Well take their grant money and their donation money, because we are not above asking for donations. So we take their donation money and all of their new knowledge and they put together aquaponics system. They use this as a site to teach workshops for other students and for adults to come into the community. And this system is part of our peace garden. And so we've rededicated our gardens as a peace garden to, um, to raise awareness about global issues and also to teach about food um, and energy independence. And as you can see behind there, we have a little worm bin that we kind of built and, um, and this is actually where our school lunch waste goes. Um, the students also host recycling fairs where they tell people from the community to come in and to bring in their recycling. But instead of the recycling itself being the goal, the goal is to actually decrease the amount of recycling and to increase the amount of sustainability education that they can provide for the public. So they bring in guest speakers, they show movies that are all aimed at getting people to not have to recycle anymore, but to live more sustainably. And then we move on to the kids do beach cleanups, but they don't just do beach cleanups. They don't go out and just pick up beach gore trash. They learn about and they remove marine debris. And they understand the context that we are in, in terms of the Pacific gyre and how we end up with the trash from everywhere else in the Pacific. And so the kids really, you can see that there's this deepening level of understanding. They've also um, done native outplanting, even to places such as Kohoalawe, which is where this picture is taken. Um, I take my class every year. And we do outplanting there and we work with water resource management there. Um, and they engage very heavily in 
culture-based and um, traditional Hawaiian planting. Um, this is in one of Oahu's last intact of Pua'a that we visit at least once a month, if not twice. Um, and so the kids are really engaged in a wide range of topics. So now you're like, Project Pono's really good. But this talk was about eco-zombies. So what's an eco-zombie? So eco-zombies, as it turns out, is not as dangerous as it sounds, although there's a potential for it to be dangerous. An eco-zombie, turns out, they're everywhere. They're little kids in every classroom, all over the place, that are learning these really great things. My seventh graders, they're reading the Young Readers edition of Omnivore's Dilemma. They're watching Dirt the Movie. They've watched Fresh. They've watched Food, Inc. They've watched Garbage the Revolution Starts at Home. They've done energy audits at their houses. They've done all these great things, right? They're, they're really amazing. So what makes them eco-zombies? Well, I set them a task. I said, let's come up with five different ways that each of you can suggest that we can put on posters to post all over our campus, all over our communities, that can help everybody else celebrate Earth Day in a positive way, and that we can convey these messages of all the things you guys have been learning. They're like, great, cool. Don't dump chemicals in the sewers was one. Uh, drive a hybrid was another. Um, ride your bike more, drive less. Buy local, buy non-GMO products. And stop smoking now. That always comes up every year. Um, so then I said, great, good, let's talk about this. Which of these can you do now? Which of these can you, 11 and 12 year olds, do right now in this classroom? Turns out, none of these things could they do in the classroom. Because these aren't their practices. These are not their promises to make. Kids don't smoke. They don't control if their parents do. They've tried to tell them not to, and sometimes it works. They don't drive. They're 12. And they can't control what their parents drive, necessarily. They can't ride bikes, because you know, it, it took my husband and I about an hour to find this bike lane. We couldn't find any. It was really hard to find an actual bike lane. And so to find a bike lane is one thing, but a lot of our kids commute an hour by car, two hours by bus. And so riding a bike is not practical for them. And about buying local, that's great if they control what they buy, but if they were to buy GMO free, nothing in the United States is necessarily labeled. So they don't have control over that either. And they don't stand in front of drains and pour stuff down. And they, they don't wash their cars, they don't fertilize their yards. They're not in control of drain dumping necessarily. So basically what happened was I raised a bunch of kids that can spout the rhetoric. They're really good at it, but they don't know how to take action. And so I watch them as they eat their fast food. Sometimes they don't tell me about it, they sneak it, but they throw their litter away. They're really good at making sure it doesn't go on the ground. And then they recycle their cans and their bottles that used to be filled with drinks that are filled with high fructose corn syrup. I mean, they know what to do. They're well-informed, well-spoken, well-meaning, but they're mostly environmentally impotent. They just can't get it going enough to actually take action because they don't know enough about it. And that's where Project Pono comes from. Project Kona comes from me wanting to show my kids that you can take action, that you start with the actions that are comfortable for you, you work from there, and you push others to help you do the same. So they turn that impotence into empowerment and action. So what does Project Pono do? A lot. The kids work between 200 and 300 hours each every year outside of class. They help with projects all over the place with all of these different focus. Um, they even come up with their own projects that take a whole year to implement, that have hundreds of people there and they, they apply for grant money, they do all these things. So they're, they're really wonderful kids. They impact a lot of people. And again, we run the risk of that eco-zombie impotence because this is not for everybody. If I was to try and do all these things on my own, I would be lost. I wouldn't even know where to start, okay? So the question then becomes, how do you, how do I, how do we live Pono, more balanced, more right, in an everyday way? So as a teacher, I use myself as an example all the time. Okay, so this understanding of the need to live more Pono was not something that I was born with, right? I, it actually came with the, the birth of my daughter, or actually when I found out I was pregnant with her. So when I found out I was pregnant with, pregnant with my mind, I realized that there were so many things that I was doing to myself that would affect somebody else directly. It was the most direct chain that I could ever imagine. I had never felt that before. Never felt like, oh, if I drink this thing, it's gonna hurt somebody. But it was really gonna hurt somebody. And so I had to think about my everyday actions. Every single thing that I did was gonna affect someone else. And then, on top of that, the things that I chose for her, which she has no control over, things like cloth diapers are disposable, homemade food, or can, all those things were gonna be her environmental legacy that she was gonna be rooted in. That was gonna be her history. And only I have control over that. And so then the choices became, well, what do I do with all of that information? How do I know if I'm part of the problem or part of the solution? 
because every single thing that you do, every action that you take, every bite that you eat, every time you get in the car, every time you turn on the TV or turn it off, you are part of a problem or part of a solution. You might be part of your own problem, your own solution, somebody else's. No matter what, we are in this wide, interconnected web. You're always affecting someone else. So what's a practical way to approach all of that? You don't have to change the world. Especially, you don't have to change it all by yourself, and you definitely don't have to do it all in one day. Right? It's a gradual process. It's slow. You have to make choices that stretch rather than break. So take where you are, where you're comfortable, and then problematize it a little bit. Stretch it just a little bit. The next day, that'll be more comfortable. And then you'll stretch again the next day, and it'll be tomorrow's comfortable. And e every day can be like that. And some days, your stretching will be sitting down and reflecting. So it's always a constant stretch. Some examples. We all eat fast food, or at least I used to. Okay, so we eat fast food. We can think about, we'll take a processed fast food meal, and maybe the next time opt for a slightly slower food. Not totally not fast food, but just something that's a little less fast. And then the next stretch, the day after, ask for it not to come without the unnecessary plastic or other wrapping. So these are slow stretches, small stretches that can make a difference. You go an even slower route. Grow your own food. Grow food for others, okay? Grow food in a sustainable way that reduces your energy dependence and thus reduces the energy dependence of your community. Grow food for peace. Educate others through your peace garden. Think about what it means to travel to some place, to take their food. What are you growing here? What are we doing? What are you importing? Just have all those thoughts in your mind. So change your Saturday ritual. You wake up, you want to go swimming, do a stream restoration. Go swimming, right? You can do this with friends, with family. It doesn't have to be just you. These are my kids in the stream with my kid, with my daughter, right? It's a big family. We do this almost every weekend, and it's wonderful. It's a great experience. She works really hard, <laughs> right? I mean, she's two, but she can carry a hoe. So, <laughs> so we do all these really great things, and, and this is wonderful. This is part of it. And at this point, you're either thinking, yeah, I could do that, or you're like, nah, she's crazy. What am I, why am I going to drag myself into that freezing cold? And it is freezing cold, that stream. Why would I drag myself into that stream just so I can help somebody else? And also, like, when do I find the time? When do I find the time in my already busy schedule? And you're right, it is hard. And sometimes I just want to spend time with my family, maybe celebrating an overly commercialized holiday, <laughs> <laughs> tying some recycled ribbons into the baby's hair for fun, right? And that's when I get hit. Green guilt, sustainability stress. People are like, how come you're not cleaning up the river today? How come your, your water is in a plastic bottle and not your stainless steel container? What happened to it? Where's your mess kit? Because I carry on a mess kit, right? Everywhere I go, where is it? How come you have a styrofoam to-go container? Don't you know it's poisonous? Right, you get all this. And, and it's, and it's because, because people don't want for you to tell them to change and them not to see you doing it every day. And so you feel that guilt, that stress, that strain. Okay, and then that's not even the worst of it. So I'm getting to what could possibly be the worst of it. Sorry, I just like the timer's on. Um, so what I'm getting to is the worst of it. The, the guilt and the stress at this point is manageable. But when it comes to, say, my family who hasn't stretched and grown with me and they're stuck in their ways, that's a whole nother scenario. So here in Hawaii, we're very well known for our luau. In particular, the baby's first luau, which I survived last year. Okay, so the baby's first luau is more epic, more decadent, attended by more people than many weddings, right? Definitely more than my own wedding. So, like everything that we do, we went to Maui to celebrate the baby's first luau, right? So I could celebrate with our 200 plus family me members, the four generations before me. We're all there. We're all celebrating. And my husband and I decided we were going to make a stand. We we're going to be the first ones in our family to say, you know what? We're not going to do disposable goods. We're going to do reusable or compostable if, if needed. And so we went with all reusable or compostable goods. We also decided that instead of having fancy centerpieces, we were gonna plant. And we were gonna give away seedlings <coughs> and plants as our centerpieces and our goodie bags. And that was fine. I think everybody was kind of like, oh, it's just them, you know, being their touchy-feely <laughs> selves. We, we can deal with that. And then I made the rule, no balloons. And that's when things got crazy. Okay, <laughs> so apparently, for my mom, she can put up with anything else that I suggest, almost anything, right, except for no balloons. No balloons to her, our conversation was something like, 
how can you have a party without balloons? <laughs> to which my response was, how can I have a party with balloons? And we went back and forth. And finally, I was like, you know, why don't we just invite a sea turtle or a lace on albatross to the party and have the kids kill it? <laughs> and, uh, okay, so <laughs> as a little extreme, for those that don't understand where that train of thought comes from, because <laughs> it does seem a little strange, I'll show you. Okay, so accidentally, inadvertently, however, balloons find their way out into our environment, right? In the air, in the, in the stream, in the waistline, whatever. They end up like this on our beaches or in our ocean, and then they end up like that, right? Lays on albatross, sea turtles, endangered um, animals, all kinds of things happen to them because of the plastics they ingest, in particular balloons, because they look really fun to everybody, right? Um, and the balloons are not really, they're not the end all be all of the evilness, right? It, it, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. The plastics, do you see it all little toys here? Those would have been the goodies that we send home with the kids that don't really care about it. They would leave them on the beach. They would leave them somewhere. And, and then all of these are actually pulled from other carcasses of Laison albatross that's put in front of this one. Okay? So this is a live Laison albatross and what shows what could have been the contents of his stomach. And that's not even the worst of it because it goes beyond that. It goes beyond just the plastics and balloons at parties. It's every plastic thing that we ever bring into our lives. That is Kanapo Beach at Koholawe. It's an uninhabited, mostly uninhabited island, Akumaka. Um, but this is all the plastic that ends up there. Okay? And the sea turtles and the birds and the monk seals that live there, they didn't bring that there. This is washed up because of part of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and part of our gyre. So people are responsible for this. And this is what I'm talking about. Every day you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. So in everything that you do, you choose. You want to get a little piece of plastic in something, you want to do that. It seems innocuous. It's one little piece of saran wrap, one little green sushi thing that comes with your food, right? But it ends up like that. And so the more that we ignore it, the more that we choose not to participate and to say, we're OK with somebody else having that plastic. I'm OK with it. It ends up with that as our legacy, right? And that's a hard thing to deal with. So the flip side of that, though, is my mom. I love her dearly. And, and what, I, what I understood in, in listening to her talk about that and then me giving her this speech and her look on her face was that she was going to have to deal with 50 years of historical guilt of animal killing or other environmental atrocities that I was accusing her of if she accepted that those balloons that she wanted at my, at my daughter's party were bad. Because she celebrated, like many people, every single special occasion of everybody's life with graduation parties, with birthday parties, with full of plastic full of balloons, full of all these things. And so I had to meet her where she was. And that's part of the solution, is to understand that everybody has their own unique starting and ending place. You should encourage stretching, not breaking. So everybody is going to take a little bit different action, right? And, and in taking that little bit of different action, you could have different results. The next thing is we have to understand that our daily actions do fluctuate, although our commitment to sustainability does not. So if people are telling me, how come you're not doing this today? How come you're not out at the beach? And I say, well, today, I'm giving you an opportunity to do that <laughs> while I recharge and rest so that I can stretch myself tomorrow. And so the last thing is that we also need suggestions on how to deal with that green guilt and sustainability stretch, but also how to encourage others to stretch, to be more Pono, live more Pono, and spread Pono. That's the end of my talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>